to me, my X-Men. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. So after X-Men 97 Episode 8, I know a lot of you are confused about all the time travel and you're probably wondering what the hell's next for Magneto after this. Enough. Does this mean the Prime Sentinels are going for good? Is Magneto back to being a villain? And how in the hell does all this time travel stuff even work? Now, a little later, I'm gonna to talk to Brianna McLordy and Tommy Bechtold to get their thoughts, but first, I wanna explain how time travel actually works in this show and in this universe. And I got a theory that the hidden savior against Bastion might actually be one of the baddest villains in the Marvel Universe, Kang the Conqueror. No, really? Yeah, really. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching us, clicking this video, and supporting us by shopping at our merch store, where, very excited to announce this, we have just launched these awesome new designs that we created for you. A 90s parody tribute shirt showing the X-Men as the cast of Friends, Morphs with our favorite shapeshifters from Treasure Planet, Doug as Cyclops, the Remember It tribute shirt, and we also have many, many, many more. The links for all of those shirts are below. Thanks so much for helping us out. So, Let's talk about time travel. Yeah, I am so confused. So where does Bastion come from anyways? He was like a little robot slime that went on a janitor and then somehow got into a lady and became a baby? Actually, yeah, that's exactly it. But so the first thing you need to know is time travel in this X-Men reality usually works like time travel in movies like Back to the Future. When you travel back to the past, you can change your future. Now we see this in episodes like Days of Future Past where Bishop travels back in time to stop an assassination and we see the repercussions in his present day. Or in season two, there's an arc called Time Fugitives, where Bishop once again changes the past, and then we see a time vortex altering Cable's more distant future, where he sees his son fade from existence. Help me, but most importantly, we saw this in the two-parter, One Man's Worth. In that episode, Master Mold sent Nimrod back in time to assassinate Charles Xavier when he was still a college student. Now, the assassination succeeded, creating an alternate present day where Magneto is leading mutants in a war against the Avengers. Oh, that sounds awesome. It really is. But here's the thing. It takes a while for changes in the timeline to ripple throughout time. Like Wolverine and Storm can see the timeline changing around them. So, this slow ripple effect gave Bishop in the future an opportunity to travel back in time and stop this assassination. While we were traveling, Fitzroy and Nimrod already nailed Xavier and changed everything. So when Bishop and alternate Wolverine and Storm fought Nimrod, the machine attached itself to a school janitor and the janitor had a son named Bastion. So Bastion is essentially the son of Nimrod who has like all of this knowledge of future events. So Bastion knows about the genetic war, days of future past, all that. So the dystopia that we saw in Bishop's timeline in season one and season two, all of that was part of this 300 year genetic war that Cable referenced. Bastion's evolutionary war lasted 300 years. So the only way to defeat Bastion is with events that he cannot foresee, events that did not occur in his original timeline. But in this episode, we learned that there are absolute points in time that can never be changed. And the destruction of Genosha will always happen no matter what. Each time we attempt to stop the attack on Genosha, we are temporally pulled away from the event. And season four gives us a huge clue about exactly why this is an absolute point in time that can never be changed. And this can give us the clue to stopping Bastion. All right, everybody, hands up. This is a robbery. <gasps> <laughs> what are you even doing, dude? I'm broke! I'm trying to support a wife and baby, so I stole a loaf of bread to feed my family, and now I, I, I'm a criminal! So, give me your money! Well, for one thing, you don't even have a weapon, so no. And, if you're broke, try making an honest living. Learn programming and back-end website development. According to Stack Overflow, the median salary for back-end web developers in the U.S. in 2023 was over $100,000. Wow, but I don't know anything about computers. That's okay. You can learn programming from Boot.dev. They're a partner for this video. Boot.dev is essentially a programming RPG where you can earn XP, complete quests, and compete in global leaderboards. Boot.dev understands that the best way to learn code is to make sure you're never bored, so they make learning fun and competitive. Well, I do love games. And I don't think I would make it on the inside. Right, so the platform gets your hands on the keyboard and gets you writing a ton of code right away. So if you've ever wanted to learn coding, this is the best way to start because you learn by doing. And the boot.dev Discord community is active and they're there for you if you ever get stuck. Also, if you're ever completely stuck or you just want to see how the instructor wrote the code, there are solutions available for every challenge on the site. So click our link in the description box and use my code to get 25% off your first payment of boot.dev. That's 25% off your first month or 
your first year, depending on the subscription that you choose. Yeah, that boot.dev, that sounds like a pretty good deal. It really is. Back to what I was saying. So in just a bit, I'm going to bring on Tommy and Brianna to get their theories. But first, I got a little more time travel stuff to explain, namely why Genosha has to happen. Why is it an essential part of the flow of time? That's the proper flow of time. And it happens again and again and again because it's supposed to. So remember how I was talking about how Bishop prevented that alternate future where Xavier was assassinated? Well, after doing that, Bishop ends up getting lost in the time stream and ends up at a place called the Crossroads of Time. But how did I get here? Through the Axis, how else? All time travelers pass through there. <laughs> Some big guy threw you off course. In the distant future, Apocalypse steals Cable's time-traveling technology, and then he also arrives at the crossroads of time. And then he starts recruiting supervillains and kidnapping psychics who are going to help him rewrite the entire timeline, all of reality, so Apocalypse was always the ruler of time. So then Bishop, Cable, Magneto, and the X-Men stop Apocalypse. So what this means is that every single event that led to the defeat of Apocalypse has to happen, or else time, as we know it, would not exist. So that means that Bishop always always has to go back in time to stop the assassination, which means that Bastion has to be created because Nimrod has to stay in the past. This also means that Sinister has to clone Jean, has to infect the baby with the techno-organic virus. So then that baby will become Cable because Cable has to exist to protect the flow of time from Apocalypse. And all of this means that Genosha had to be destroyed because somehow these events all lead to Apocalypse's eventual defeat in Beyond Good and Evil. Now, I do have a theory about how Kang is going to defeat Bastion, and believe it or not, that theory is actually based on the original series. But first, I want to hear from Tommy Bechtold and Brianna McLarty. So, Tommy, uh, the episode ended on a massive cliffhanger, Magneto saying enough, turning off all of the electronics, presumably causing plane crashes, deaths all around the world. Uh, where do you think the show's going to go from here? Is he still a villain? Yes, I think, and he's also a patsy. I believe he's fallen for the perfect trap uh, from Bastion. Really? He has now made mutants the uh, unforgivable villains. All mutants will be judged for Magneto's actions. Everybody with a pacemaker, everybody on life support, mm -hmm. are, uh, all of the human life lost will now be blamed on any mutant, not just Magneto. Uh, I think that... The, the 4D chess that Bastion has been playing uh, this uh, on the X-Men continues, and I think that only the mind of Charles Xavier, the man that I've argued should come back to this show against against all of my foes who wanted a pro Professor X-less X-Men 97. Wow. Uh, I thought it were, I thought the show works better without him. You know, we had you know, and Mike I'm Lawrence on a few I'm, weeks ago, and I'm telling you, yes. I, I'm dubious about him returning, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> so that's such an interesting theory. So you're saying that he wanted Val Cooper to do this. And yeah. You know what? Why was he so sloppy? Why would he be so sloppy yeah. about it? Why, why, why would he leave Val Cooper alone with Magneto, and uh, and, and where where he could easily be set free, unless. That was the plan. And why why not tell Val Cooper about Genosha? Why not use a different right. government patsy? And right. most importantly, why leave Magneto alive to begin with? Like that's one right. I think your theory is great because it answers that question. So Brianna, you know, we know that Bastion comes to power through a three hundred uh, year war, genetic war uh, against humans and mutants. We've seen, like I talked about earlier, we've seen parts of that war and Days of Future Past, it's, it's Bishop's future. Um, there was also a confusing thing where they had to go back to that future to go back in time and, and certain things like that. So d what do you think about Tommy's theory? Do you think he's on the nose here about this kicking off the genetic war and is it starting earlier or is this how it always started? I think he is on the nose about kicking off the genetic war. And I would say this is probably where it always started specifically because apart from just Magneto, you know, start like killing a ton of people essentially by turning off all the electronics you also have proven that this new brand of sentinel is really 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 powerful and we know val cooper was working with magneto so you kind of have a perfect time for the military to be like well let's weaponize the sentinels and you have a perfect time for the military to be like well if we want to work with bastion actually especially if bastion like he because we've only seen him kind of as an emerald prior to this. So if, especially if he's kind of more hidden, you don't have, like, they don't know he's working with someone like Mr. Sinister or Dr. Doom per se. He can sort of act as a smokescreen and then they can be like, oh, well, we want to work with you because you've created this really strong tech that will prevent us from these mutants. And then when you have, like, 
the world governments behind the Sentinels, that's just like the perfect place for a whole out war to start. Yeah, and you know, just like in the comics, in the comics, Bastion was kind of already in the government, but he didn't have full approval for Operation Zero Tolerance yet. And I think we're seeing the same thing here where the UN had that secret building in, in Madripoor, you know, where everything's legal anyways. They had that secret right. lab where he could develop all this stuff, but he wasn't, you're right, he wasn't necessarily given carte blanche. And I think this will finally give him that permission. I want to throw out a little bit of a, an X factor here. Um, <laughs> one thing that Bastion did not plan and did not count on was apparently Gyrick trying to assassinate Xavier. Like when our village idiot Gyrick made a martyr of Xavier and... So this was something that was not, you know, like I talked about earlier, Nimrod slash Bastion knows the future, right? Because he was sent from the future. So he knows how events are supposed to unfold. He did not know that Gyrick was going to shoot Xavier or didn't count on it. He thought that Xavier was dead because he was surprised with the Shi'ar broadcast. At least I assume he was. Maybe he was just pleased there was a broadcast he could release to the public. So again, the X factor, haha, is Xavier. You know, maybe if, if you guys are right, Magneto was always supposed to start this war, but Xavier was the part that he couldn't foresee. And I'm going to go back and, and reference uh, the two-parter One Man's Worth, where Nimrod slash, you know, where, where Nimrod slash Master Mold in the future sent Nimrod and, and Fitzroy back in time to kill Xavier, right? Because Z Xavier was still capable of stopping him at that point. Like something about having the X-Men around made his victory not inevitable. So there is something with Xavier here, um, but how is that gonna work? Is it because Xavier is gonna stop Master Mold or Tommy, is it because Xavier's gonna stop Magneto? Well, I, I wonder if it, if it, you know, the ultimate message of Xavier is mutants and humans living together in harmony, right? And, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I believe perhaps the, the thing that can stop this, this, this genetic war is somehow reclaiming the the reputation of mutants uh, an act of heroicism mutants saving human lives although it is kind of a vicious cycle it's like mutants come to the rescue humans are appreciative of the mutants mutants are to blame for some catastrophe mm -hmm. humans want all mutants to be imprisoned or eliminated so it's uh you know i wonder if if it's not so much stopping magneto but if it's more proving the, that the X-Men are a valuable part of, uh, of uh, protecting the human race I, I, and uh, somehow getting the humans on the side, like, like the, not the government humans, but the civilian humans mm -hmm. on the side of the mutants. And I wonder if it's a, rather, rather just the nobility of the X-Men uh, per persevering over Magneto's more uh, hardline kind of uh, uh, totalitarian let's let's put the humans under our thumb yeah and maybe that's part of it too so in the alternate future that i referenced earlier from one man's worth mm -hmm. we see that without xavier magneto was leading all these mutants against the avengers and the humans and he was losing so bastion knows that magneto cannot win and maybe you're right maybe the path here isn't that xavier is going to defeat magneto like literally but he's going to defeat him in a more figurative way and doing what he does best like he did to the shiar taking everybody to school um brianna right. Bo DeMaio, you know, who's been tweeting out like episodes to watch or essential reading beforehand, tweeted out an image of Uncanny X-Men 304. So in case, you know, you guys watching at home don't know, um, Uncanny X-Men 304 was the second part of this crossover called Fatal Attractions. Magneto had been a hero in the comics. He died for like two years. And then he came back in this issue as a full on supervillain. He has this group of acolytes who worship him. He's going to take over the world for good. Colossus joins him because Colossus is grieving. And that leads into a story um, where basically there's a, a big confrontation between Xavier and Magneto where he has to make like a really tough choice. So Brianna, given that that has been tweeted, it definitely looks like he's going to be a villain coming up. But where do you think this is leading? Like, do you think that all the Prime Sentinels are just gone and now Magneto is the main villain of the show? No, I think that even if the Prime Sentinels will be, like, they might be gone for a while, I think they will, at the very least, show up again in the finale. Um, just because I, they're such a powerful villain to just basically have them gone and, like, we just saw them appear at, like, the end of Episode 7, and then we had Episode 8, and I was like, oh, okay, no Prime Sentinels. Like, the, I just don't see that happening. I do think Magneto will probably be 
the main villain for Charles Xavier, like personally, partially because of their relationship and also because I think he's going to be have, like he's going to be the person that has to go deal with him and possibly even like wipe his mind like in the comics. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that Magneto is going to be the most dangerous thing for the X-Men specifically more than the Prime Sentinels because of the backlash they're going to get, especially mm-hmm. because Magneto was like, this isn't even a two year gap. This is like a week. Maybe, Mm. maybe like a week is like, I think the longest it could be. I think it's more likely that it's like a couple of days that Mm. Magneto's been gone since Genosha. So you basically might have been a week or two, but sure. Uh, Yeah. So you have Genosha, you don't see Magneto. And then when Magneto like rises from the ashes of Genosha, he just like cuts off all the electricity. Right. He is like the single biggest threat to the X-Men from like in the sense that he is going to lead them to get attacked by everyone else because he was Mm. just leading the X-Men. Like people will think that this is an X-Men led effort. That's true. I love that. I hadn't even thought about that, that people would still perceive Magneto as leader of the X-Men. That makes so much sense. So again, I think Tommy's right. I think this is going to kickstart the genetic war that Bastion's going to use to rise to power. I think Sinister is a patsy in all this. Like, Sinister is like, oh, I'm going to get my ability to experiment again, not realizing that mutants are just going to be, like, to what end, you know? Tommy, go ahead. And he also also did his his typical Bond villain thing where he's like, I'm playing Bastion. I'm the one that is the the ultimate brain here. It's like, I feel like Mr. Sinister's destiny is always to be like, I am the one who knows all, only to fall short. Like, he's he's kind of the star scream of... uh, of uh to make a transformers uh uh reference uh of uh of of the x-men villains like he's the one that's always always so close to taking over megatron but i uh, just can't do it. You know, yeah. uh, magneto's just gonna release a prime sentinel on him at some point yeah. like a whole wave True, right? yeah. that's gonna be it <laughs> by sinister now i one thing though that you made me think um i always thought it was weird in episode two and three that Gene just escaped Sinister's lab. I always thought that whole storyline felt mm-hmm. very rushed. And now I'm wondering, yeah. you know, earlier I talked about how there's certain things that have to happen. And one of those things is Cable having to be created, you know, to go in the future. I'm wondering if mm-hmm. that Bastion also wanted that to happen, right? Because it's very strange mm-hmm. that Gene shows up, we have the Goblin Queen heel turn, that all of these things unfolded in such a fast amount of time just so baby Nate could get the techno-organic virus and be sent to the future. Do you guys think that Cable being created is also an essential part of Bastion's plan, or is he the strange, unknown element that can disrupt everything? I See, I thought the latter. I, I, I thought it was Cable was the X factor. Again, no pun intended, but like it was like the create the, 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 uh, the impetus of him getting infected with the techno virus and then Bishop having to take him to the future to, to save him, to find a cure and, and provide him with the best chance at living creates this time traveling mercenary that can kind of like mess up people's plans, but also has an understanding of how time works and can educate the X-Men. Like so far, all, I, although as I'm saying this now, it's like so far the, the sole source of information for the X-Men is Cable it's like, I guess if Bastion could control the information that Cable knows, then I guess he, I guess, it, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Now I, I kind of talked myself out of it by talking. But by it could also it. Like, be, it's like, it could I, be like the Matrix. It could be another system of control. They have something that's yeah. been set up because, again, right. I will say, I think they have this going for them. I think that the fact that Cable is actually from a lot further in the future. You know, he was supposed to go in time with Bishop. Yeah. They were separated in the time stream, which I guess we did see in Beyond Good and Evil Part 1. Right. And then, but Cable is from like 1500 years in the future. So Cable knows what happens to Bastion's utopia. It gets destroyed by apocalypse, right? Right. Like I was talking about earlier. Brianna, what do you think? Where does Cable fit into all this? It's interesting because I kind of think he's both like the X Factor and completely planned. I just think that, I think he was planned at the beginning because in my opinion, there's no way that Bastion just was going to let Mr. Sinister specifically go make like an invincible mutant that makes Mm. no sense with his plans. Why would he want that? But by infecting Nathan with the um, techno virus, 
I wonder if that was a big part of sort of the experimenting that Bastion needed to do in order to create the Prime Sentinels, but then he didn't see him becoming this like time travel mercenary. Like he needed him to get infected, needed to see how it would affect him and like basically use him as an experiment. And then he was like, oh no, now he's a time travel mercenary. I did not mm. plan for that. I just needed to see him. I also don't think Madeline is dead, but that's a separate thing. Mm. He says, Cable says in this last episode, that the the prime sentinels are infected with the same techno organic virus sinister used on him and he also specifically says that the prime sentinels are the next step of human evolution the entire point is to make mm. them the next step in humanity sinister's whole thing is taking mutations and taking mutants and adapting them to have like the purest gene pool possible right we saw that in the season five episode mm. descent this makes me think, and I'm literally just hearing you guys and coming up with this now. This makes me think mm -hmm. that Sinister did not tell Bastion about this experiment. Because it sounds to me like Sinister, like you said, Tommy, Sinister was trying to make a prime sentinel that is a mutant. He was trying to one up mm -hmm. that evolutionary step, right? So that backfired on him because, again, he was planning on turning baby Nate into like a prototype for prime sentinel mutants to take Bastion's technology, use it on mutants, and win the war. But then we get Cable instead. Yeah, I, that actually would make a lot of sense, especially because Sinister, again, thinks he's in so much control and he's, yeah. I don't think he is. No. <laughs> well, he never is. But he's also, uh, yeah, you know, he, yeah. he, he's, he, but he's like the perfect cockroach, like he's unkillable. He's never he's never fully in control. He's he's often vanquished, and then he and then he comes back again. Like you think he's dead, and then there he is. He comes back out of the woodwork, crawls back out from under an old mm -hmm. shoebox. But uh, I uh, yeah I, I I I think I think with these prime sentinels, we're poised for some heartbreak of. Uh, I, I I know that there's a lot of fan voice to like keep some of the people who have died dead. But I could see us getting a uh, Madeline Pryor and a and a Gambit Prime Sentinel zombie Oof. fight like versions of those characters in the finale, where like the X Men are having to face off against the people they love who are now Prime Sentinels like in the afterlife. So or, or whatever. Well, I I personally do not want Gambit to come back. I don't want them to use no. time travel to bring him back. But yeah. a zombie Gambit, oh yeah. my god, against Rogue specifically, <laughs> yeah. oh heartbreaking. So along those lines, I want to throw out a couple of things. Uh, first, in the episode Time Fugitives from season two, we see um, there's a virus that is similar to the techno-organic virus the apocalypse creates that can infect humans. And the whole point of that storyline is mm -hmm. that once that virus jumps to mutants, it spreads out of control and it kills a bunch of people. However, Cable needed that virus to spread because in his future, everybody has antibodies to it. I think that might actually be the origin of this virus, right? I think that this whole thing that we're seeing here, it'd be so ironic if it was created by Apocalypse to begin with. So that's one thing. The other, so that's establishing that this techno-organic virus right now, and Bast Bastion's version of it, only affects humans. What about Rogue, Brianna? So she touches Gyric, right? And then all of a sudden she has these visions of Nimrod and then she kills Trask. And to me, I thought it was really mm -hmm. weird that she touches Gyric and then she's just found on the street. It almost made me think that she got possessed by this and that she is a hidden prime sentinel. Do you think that could happen? I think wow. she could be a hidden prime sentinel. I think it's more likely because of her power specifically that as opposed to going like a full sentinel, like some of the other, like basically every other human we've seen be infected with it. I think she could like have like literally like a war in her own head against the sentinel part of her and against the real part of her like again just because her power is literally taking power and from memories people, so and identities that, like, that's right yeah and especially because that would also make me think of virus especially like that type of virus her body could naturally fight off better than say like a regular x-men i think that's even true to some extent because she hasn't just like insta died from it i kind of have been curious if uh, like any of the other mutants got infected would they just like die immediately because that kind of seems like a simpler way to do well this. wolverine but yeah. i wonder if, fashion if it's the techno organic it. virus i mentioned earlier wolverine's healing factor created the antibodies that you know they sent to the future and everything 
uh, because the show really goes down some some weird rabbit holes. But you made me think of something, right? So there's an episode, I think, in season two where Rogue has Carol Danvers in her subconscious and she has this whole like psychic fight against her within her own mind. I could definitely see them staging the Prime Sentinels in that way. But um, mm. in the comics, there's an arc where Cassandra Nova infects the X-Men with these nano sentinels, which are like in their bloodstream, slowly killing them. And uh, there's a mutant called Zorn who's able to heal them. And then, uh, okay, okay, I'll just say it. Zorn is secretly Magneto. And, it, you know, because he can control the metal. So let's just go ahead and if we're going to write out this story, say maybe she is infected and there's one person who can fix her and that's Magneto. And maybe that could even be his like heroic mm. sacrifice to redeem himself at the end of the season. So, um, I'm going to go yeah. on until I've got a theory, a uh, pretty crazy theory, about who could be the surprise villain is that comes in and saves the day here for everybody. Uh, but I want to get, like, final final thoughts on, like, the big thing you guys think is going to be happening in the, in the final two episodes. Tommy, what's the big surprise going to be? I think I think the big surprise is, is going to be that the X-Men are going to end this season at a loss. I don't think that, I don't think this is going to be, everything will be... Revealed. Maybe that's not a big surprise, but I don't think everything's going to be sewn up. I think that there will be no X Men at the end of this, and and kind of a like scattered mutants scattered around as complete fugitives, and we're going to start season two in a world that is completely anti mutant and 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 basically uh, Bastion com- winning, Bastion Bastion creating Prime Sentinels and and, evo- and evolving humans in, in the way that Cable said. I also could see, uh, as I said, the zombifying of the characters that we've lost so far. I do think, I do think the the final battle. I like the idea. My prediction: showdown, rogue zombie gambit in the final episode. That's what I'm going to go with. Uh, that would be awesome, Brianna. What about you? What's your big surprise? I definitely think it will be kind of like an Empire Strikes Back ending. I think they are going to end at the loss. I think the X Mansion will be probably destroyed, whether it's mm. by Bastion. Again, yeah. but I I wonder if it's going to be by Bastion or the government. Like I really yeah. think the ending is going to be sort of like the Civil War ending, where I mm-hmm. think they have to go on the run from like the U.S. and government mm-hmm. and the U.N. and maybe like even kind of like go back to Australia. I don't know. I think they're going to have to go into hiding and basically I think in the second season they're going to be operating as a terrorist group. And you never know. We you know we got some Avengers set up. We might actually get to see Avengers versus X Men. I could see the like the montage at the end of the tenth episode being a bunch of mutants that we or a bunch of Marvel heroes that we know going into hiding, you know, That'd a bunch exciting. of people, a bunch of oh, that'd be uh, amazing, yeah. Just just show us the full on uh, genetic war. That's what I say. Like, give give us the dirt, give us the nasty. Oh, guys, thank you both very much for joining me. You can find their social links below. Now, one thing we know for sure is that at some point after Bastion's utopia is achieved, Apocalypse does return and takes over the world. We know this because in Cable's distant future, he is fighting the forces of Apocalypse. But you said they defeated Apocalypse. They did, but then in the episode The Fifth Horseman in season five, Apocalypse returned. So Apocalypse could very well be the villain who ends up defeating Bastion. This show could be setting up a seasons long alternate timeline story like the excellent Age of Apocalypse cross over, which was like Days of the Future Past on MGH. And one thing to remember here is that Cable has always been trying to stop the Genosha Massacre. That's why he was in the episode Slave Island back in season one. His name is Cable. Cable's probably reasoned that without Genosha, Bastion's war never begins, so Apocalypse never rises to defeat him. So Apocalypse rising early, definite a possible ending for the show. But the end of the episode Beyond Good and Evil revealed a surprise villain, Immortus, aka a variant of Kang the Conqueror that we met in Quantumania. None of us killed him, they did. So, all through this arc, Immortus was posing as a little goofball named Bender, who was apparently insane. Step on a dime, you'll be here for all time! But Immortus was actually guiding Bishop into defeating Apocalypse. Apocalypse? What does he have to do with it? Oh, nothing much. He's just screwing around with the whole space-time continuum! Now, we know that this X-Men universe is part of the Marvel multiverse that includes the MCU. We saw the Watcher above Genosha, and there are other subtle connections to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So, this Citadel at the center of time could be at the same junction point as the Kang Citadel that we see in Quantumania, a place where the Council of Kangs can gather together. But then where are all the other Kangs? Well, like, all the Kangs don't hang out there all the time. They were just together in Quantumania for a big meeting. Okay, uh, you know what? I'm in a meeting. I'll call you back.
Well, 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 look who decided to show up. Now, we did see in the Loki finale that the Kangs are mostly being managed by the TVA, but we have already seen that there is at least one Kang variant who has a vested interest in this universe, and that Kang variant is going to make sure that it doesn't get destroyed. The only way a Kang variant could interfere is if Bastion's actions directly affected the existence of the time stream, like Apocalypse did in Beyond Good and Evil. And I think this is exactly what Bastion's going to do. You see, one event Bastion did not count on was Magneto being freed. I I think that with Magneto causing mass power outages and untold deaths around the world, Apocalypse will wake from his slumber. And this will lead to an alternate future where Apocalypse wins the genetic war hundreds of years too early, which could then result in him being successful in rewriting time. So Immortus, aka Kang, or maybe even the TVA, are going to have to step in and prevent this from happening. So what do you guys think? Is Kang going to appear in this show, or is that theory a little bit too bonkers for you? Special thanks again to Brianna and Tommy. You can find their social links below. And let us know what you guys think down in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, welcome to the channel. Please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.